Welcome to Savvy Sab's podcast. I'm your host, Sabrina Salvati. My special guest today is Norm Finkelstein. He is a political scientist and activist. His primary fields of research are the politics of the Holocaust and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Thank you so much for coming on, Norm. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. So I think the first the first question I have for you in reference to uh, this issue with Israel and Gaza, I think the first time I actually talked about what was happening to the Palestinian people was almost three years ago. And it was of a viral video of a 10 year old girl whose apartment building was just demolished right by Israel. And she said, I'm only 10 years old. What am I supposed to do? What do you expect me to do with all of this? One of the things that I've heard you mention before is that Israel also has this tendency to mow the lawn. And I, I want to talk a little bit about that because there have been a lot of mainstream media pundits that are referring to October 7th as if there wasn't Israeli oppression and occupation uh, before that date. Can you talk a little bit about what it means to mow the lawn? One of the problems when you discuss a conflict like this is you never know where to begin. In the case of the Israelis, they like to begin 3,000 years ago with the Kingdom of Judea or some Jewish presence in Palestine. Um, those who, uh, I don't take sides in the conflict in terms of being pro-Palestinian or pro-Israeli but Palestinians tend to like to begin with the end of the 19th century when there is this Zionist movement that emerges and has set as its goal to create a Jewish state in Palestine. And it was the nature of the goal, or at least it appeared to be the nature of the goal, that the realization of a Jewish state in Palestine would necessarily have as a consequence either the reduction of the indigenous population to a second class citizenship or what seemed much more likely back then, the expulsion. They used to use a euphemism they called a transfer, uh, the expulsion of the indigenous population. So that's uh, another starting point, the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the um, a Zionist movement. A third starting point can be 1947, when the United Nations General Assembly passed Resolution 181, which called for the creation of two states in Palestine, a Jewish state and an Arab state. And depending on which side you're on, those who support Israel say that uh, there could have been two states, but the Arabs rejected it, or those on the Palestinian side who say, well, Israel got a state, but we didn't, and so we should get one to, in accordance with UN Resolution 181. Another starting point is 1967, when Israel, in the course of the June 1967 war, conquered the West Bank, which at that time was controlled by Jordan and Gaza, which at that time was controlled by Egypt. And Israel now controlled the whole of what's called historic Palestine or British mandated Palestine. I'm not gonna bore your listeners with where the British came into this. Uh, I'll just use the technical term, British mandated Palestine. And then, um, the terms for ending the occupation, which Israel began in 1967. And that starting point has as its consequence UN Resolution 242 and subsequent UN General Assembly and international law refinements of UN Resolution 242, which called for <clears throat> the creation of two states as in 1947, but this time a significantly truncated, diminished Palestinian state that would incorporate the whole of the West Bank and East Jerusalem, including East Jerusalem and Gaza. 
So that's a fourth possible uh, starting point. A fifth starting, possible starting point is 2006. Uh, in 2006, there were elections throughout the Palestinian occupied territories, meaning the West Bank and Gaza. The fifth starting point, as I said, was 2006. That's when there were parliamentary elections in the Palestinian occupied territories, and Hamas won those elections. I'm going to stick now, and I admit it's completely arbitrary. Um, I'm going to start with 2006, that fifth starting point, because if I start with the first one, we'd have to go through the pages of the Bible, and we would be here until you had great-grandchildren, and I had long turned to dust and ashes. So uh, when Israel imposed, uh, after the elections, which incidentally were called for by the United States, that was when the U.S. under George Bush was in the democracy promotion mode. And part of promoting democracy was to have elections in the occupied Palestinian territories. Uh, the Palestinians, uh, not just the main organization, uh, what's called the Palestinian Authority, but also Hamas surprisingly agreed to participate in the elections. And then a double surprise, they won them. Now, the people of Gaza, uh, you know, you can't prove these things with scientific precision, but it seemed pretty clear the Palestinian Authority, which was then and still is hopelessly corrupt, it's just basically they collect the rent from the Palestinians for Israel. They are, um, and they get rewarded for it, you know, for collecting the rent, they get VIP treatment. They get nice salaries and most of it stuffed away and lots of corruption. So um, <clears throat> the Palestinians basically voted for Hamas uh, because Hamas had a good record in social services. It had all of these charitable organizations. And back then, I'm not going to speak about now, back then they were reasonably honest. Now, if you want to know what Hamas was like back then, you can read a good book by Sarah Roy the Harvard uh, Middle Eastern scholar. Uh, she wrote a book on Hamas. It's basically its social service network and things like that. So people voted for Hamas, not because they wanted to destroy the state of Israel, not because of the charter, which nobody read. <clears throat> I don't think 90% of people in Hamas have read their charter. Uh, it's one of those documents that Israel likes to pull out, uh, but which Palestinians never read. Don't give a darn about they vote for it because it seemed like, given the choices, the choices were very limited, like our Democratic and Republican Party, given the very limited choices. And that's the truth. I mean, Hamas and the Palestinian Authority are the only games in town. So it's like our Democrats and Republicans, given the choice, they vote for Hamas because it seemed like, relatively speaking, a reform organization, reformist. It would reform, at least it would be honest. You know, well, the United Israel and the United States and then the EU reacted in horror at this Hamas victory, and then they imposed a brutal blockade of Gaza, economic blockade of Gaza. Now, Gaza was already for a long time, since 1990, it had already been subject to what was called a closure, which meant traveling was very limited for the people of Gaza. The person who has written most eloquently on this subject is Israel's leading authority in Gaza, uh, named Amira Haas. And she's always insistent that the, block, that the uh, um, isolation of, of Gaza, the attempt to reduce it, I'm using her terms now, to a giant concentration camp, they didn't begin in 2006. It really began around 1990. Leaving that aside, again, another starting point. Uh, leaving that aside, once the economic blockade of Gaza was imposed, a disaster quickly ensued. So what does an economic blockade of Gaza mean? And let's, what does the total blockade of Gaza mean? It means 
Nobody can go in without Israel's permission. Nobody can leave without Israel's permission. Uh, nothing, nothing can go in, nothing can go out without Israel's uh, permission. Um, and that in effect means with the most marginal of exceptions, the most marginal exceptions, nobody can leave Gaza, uh, including people who are suffering from terminal illnesses, want to get medical care abroad, unless Israel gives permission, and often it doesn't. Sometimes it only gives permission on condition that you're willing to be a, uh, a um, I'm using the slang, being a rat for Israel, namely being a collaborator, participating in Israeli intelligence, and they're very forthright about it. And there is an extensive documentation on that. So they say you can get cancer treatment, but only if you promise to rat on X, Y, and Z, or give us certain information. So, uh, and then there was a long period where Israel, it restricted, I wonder if I can find a list here. Give me one half moment. Let's see. I think it was somewhere around here. Here, uh, a typical list. No, this is actually, it's so, it's so satanic. A typical list of what Israel forbade to enter Gaza, okay? Uh, and you're gonna you're gonna shake your head and ask, why that? Sage, coriander, ginger, jam, halva, vinegar, nutmeg, chocolate, fruit preserves, nuts, biscuits, potato chips, musical instruments, notebooks, writing implements toys, chicks, and goats. <laughs> you know, totally ill, totally sick. And then they put the people of Gaza on a caloric diet, what they called a humanitarian minimum, which is to say a starvation plus diet. Um, to limit their caloric intake, the people of Gaza. Now, that was a long-standing policy. Uh, it, it eventually ended, it ended, I think, after 2009. I can't now remember the exact dates. But that's what it meant to put a blockade on Gaza. You know, sometimes you can, you know, you can have marginal space for, well, Maybe it's a blockade, but it's not all that bad a blockade. No, actually, it was an unusually cruel, satanic blockade uh, of Gaza. And uh, the Gazan economy was totally destroyed. Uh, Sarah Roy, who I mentioned earlier, she wrote a classic book on the subject called uh, The Gaza Strip, the, de -devel uh, the political economy of de-development. Namely, Gaza had a reasonably sustainable economy, but Israel's, uh, uh, Israel um, systematically, methodically destroyed the economy to the point that now, now I wrote about it in my book, Gaza, an in, in inquest into its martyrdom. I said, there are all these economic reports on Gaza, but it's completely crazy because there is no economy in Gaza. There's nothing. How could there be? How could there be an economy if you're not letting anything in and not letting anything out? Once in a while, Israel lets strawberries out. I'm serious. I mean, you can name the number of items they allow the Gazans to export. Once in a while, they let strawberries be exported from Gaza. So 90% uh, of the people of Gaza right now uh, live on uh, handouts, you know, international aid, international subsidies. There is no economy in Gaza. There is a young man, I'm not going to name him because I don't want to get, get into a public dispute with him. I don't think it's worth it. He was very insistent that Gaza, Gaza is, quote, a developing country. And I got into a long correspondence with him. <laughs> I said, that's just an insane proposition. There's no economy in Gaza. How can you call it? And then, a developing country. 
I said, a developing country, when I think of a nice developing country, I think of Ecuador. Uh, I've been to Ecuador. It's not rich, but it's also not what you would call abjectly poor. Uh, people dress simply, but they dress nicely. You know, it's a simple, it's a developing country. And I said to this young man, I said, does Gaza look to, like Quito? <laughs> does Gaza look like Buenos Aires? I mean, developing country. No, 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 no. Please don't go there. The um, the head of Israel's National Security Council, his name is, was, he was the head, not any longer. His name is Giora Island, G-I-O-R-A-E-I-L-A-N-D. And in 20, uh, 2004, Island was in uh, speaking with some Americans. Uh, we got the cable actually through WikiLeaks an account of the conversation. And he just said very casually, now remember, he's the, the head of Israel's National Security Council. He knows every inch of Gaza. He really does. Okay? That's his bailiwick to know Gaza. And he just said very casually, Gaza is a huge concentration camp. And I said to this guy, um, I said to this guy who was in correspondence with, finally was terminated by me, thank God, because I've been saying that with this correspondence, I feel like I have to answer everybody. And right now I'm just glad my YouTubes aren't translating to Chinese or I would be answering <laughs> email. Each day's email would take me my, the whole of my life. But I, I, I said to him, Let's say you're right. Gaza is just another developing country. I said, then why didn't he? Oh, by the way, Giora Island is this fanatical ultra, ultra Zionist lunatic. I mean, he's completely off the map, off the map. I said, then why wouldn't Giora Island, when he saw Gaza or when he envisages Gaza, why doesn't he say, hey, gee whiz, this looks just like Quito? Or gee whiz, this looks just like uh Buenos Aires but he doesn't say that he says it's a huge concentration camp and he just says it very casually because it's so perfectly obvious to the naked eye well that's going to bring me to the answer to your question which has taken me about 20 minutes and that's because by training I'm a professor which means I'm a windbag so <laughs> it takes 20 minutes to clear my throat um uh, so in answer to your question, every few years, as is to be expected, when you have people, 2.3 million people, half of whom are children under the age of 17, it's to be expected that there's going to be a slave revolt. Remember, in our own country, there were about, my I was just looking at, there were about 50 slave revolts, uh, either 30 or 50, I can't remember the exact number. But every once in a while, there's going to be a slave revolt. Uh, and then Israel will, uh, as it calls it, mow the lawn in order to, uh, to put the people in their place, remind them who's in charge, and make sure they lower their heads. You know, lower your head. You don't look the master straight in the eyes. You don't do that. Uh, I remember my mother, just in a side note, I'm a professor, you'll excuse me. Uh, my mother once had to testify at a Nazi war crimes trial. She had been in the Nazi concentration camps and there was a trial in Dusseldorf. And one of the prerequisites for the testifying is you had to identify the defendant. You had to be go over and say, yes, I remember her. And there were two things that preempted that from happening. Number one, the defendants had completely changed because it was 40 years later. When she was in the camps with them, they were these very lean Aryan types with the crisp uniform. And 40 years later, I, I went with her. I went for, with her for the trial. It was in Dusseldorf, Germany. 40 years ago, they were let's use the politically correct word, they were very large and they were wearing these 
pleated skirts and drab blouses. And my mother turned to me in complete shock, complete shock. She turned to me and she said, oh my God, they're washwomen. In her mind's eye, it was the lean, crisp Aryan superwomen, you know, supermen, ubermensch. And now she suddenly saw them and they were, my mother was a snob. Let's be, let's not make any bones about it. She said, oh my God, they were washwomen. And the other thing, and that brings me back to the point, which will bring me back and bring me back and bring me back till I finally get to your question. The other point was you weren't allowed to look at them in their face. You had to always have your head down. So she couldn't really actually identify them. You were not allowed to look at them. So that's the people of Gaza. Every time they lifted their heads, they rebelled. They have to, the, lawn, the lawn has to be mown. But I have to enter two caveats into that. Caveat number one is very often Israel attacked Gaza for nothing, have nothing to do with Gaza. They wanted to revenge the, their loss in 2006 in Lebanon. So how were they going to revenge their loss in the 2006 war in Lebanon? They're not going to tangle with the Hezbollah, the party of God, uh, because you don't tangle with the party, party of God. There's a very big price to pay when you go to, uh, when you, uh, go to war with the Hezbollah. Those people are utterly, totally, fanatically, insanely, call it what you want, uh, committed to the cause. And before they cede an inch of ground, there are going to be many slain Israelis. Um, so how are they going to uh, avenge the death of no, their defeat in Gaza in 2006? They're going to avenge it by attacking the people of Gaza to show how strong they are and you know, are a bully. They're not going to attack. They're not going to try round two with the Hezbollah, but they will prove how strong they are by kicking in the teeth of the people of Gaza. Of course, kicking in the teeth is a very mild euphemism, but what it means, each mowing of the lawn means you kill uh, several hundred, several thousand Palestinians, you kill seven hundred, several hundred children, and you destroy all of the infrastructure. That's what mowing, as a practical matter, I can go through the details of each of Israel's mowings of the lawn, but time won't allow. Uh, in 2008, Eight nine Operation Cast Lead had nothing to do with uh, uh, Gaza. It was Lebanon. 2012 Operation Pillar of Defense had nothing. To, uh, what it had to do was Gaza was prospering too much. Can't go into the details. So it was time to throw it back to the Stone Age. Um, and I won't go through it, but the mowings of the lawn. Uh, Whereas I said, uh, these periodic attempts to remind Israel who's in charge, but with the caveat that sometimes Israel just found a pretext to exert its might and restore what it calls its deterrence capacity. That is to say, restore the Arab world's fear of it. And the way you restore the Arab world's fear of Israel is by committing another and another and another and another massacre in Gaza. Uh, but I would have to say clearly uh, what happened after October 7th was something of a different order because if you keep to the metaphor of mowing the lawn, the expectation is the grass will grow back and then at some point you have to mow it again. But right. after October 7th, Israel decided it was time to find the final solution to the Gaza question, enough is enough. We're not going in to mow the lawn. Uh, if I can use, continue with that me metaphor, this time we're going to extirpate, which means pull out by the roots. We're going to extirpate every blade of grass in Gaza. Uh, when you mow the lawn, it assumes the roots remain and they will grow back. But this time to use the uh, technical metaphor, uh, extirpate, it's used with plants or trees to pull out by the root. And this time they decided uh, they're going to 
pull out by the root all the blades of grass in Gaza, including uh, half of whom are children. Um, actually, now somebody just sent me today uh, the graph of the number of deaths in Gaza as compared to any other daily deaths in Gaza as compared to any other conflict in the world. For Gaza, and I'm talking about every other conflict in the world, it's 136 deaths per day. The next largest number, I think, is three. It's three. Three or five, but I think three. I'll say five or three. I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, it's a staggering achievement by Israel. So, uh, yeah, so the, the range, the range of what Israel has been trying to do in Gaza, it ranges from simply a mass, mass ethnic cleansing into Sinai, just sweep all the Palestinians into the Egyptian Sinai desert. Uh, the middle, the middle ray, the middle of the spectrum is just turning Gaza into some place that's literally, literally uninhabitable. And then the people have no choice but to leave. If you just, there's nothing left. The water is poisoned. The ground is poisoned by the weapons that are being used. Um, and there's nothing left now or in the foreseeable or maybe in any future. I can't obviously predict that. And the third possibility is just to kill everybody. And there are a lot of people who feel that way, you know, in Israel. I want to. The most wanna, stark, wanna, yeah, just the most stark expression of that third point on the spectrum ethnic cleansing make Gaza uninhabitable, uninhabitable. And the third point is just kill everyone. It's actually Prime Minister Netanyahu who kept, who kept saying that we're in a war against Amalek. And to say you're in a war against Amalek, the biblical reference is it means that you kill every man, woman, and child. Right. I want to get your opinion, Norm, about some of the presidential candidates, I feel, get this issue incredibly wrong. Um, and I feel like some of them, like RFK Jr., for example, I feel like he's doing it on purpose. I, I feel like he does not. He knows the truth, but I feel like he's trying to keep APAC off of his back. There are two quick clips I want to show you. One is from an interview recently of Marianne Williamson about the occupation. And the other one is from RFK Jr. and Chris Cuomo where RFK Jr. is basically saying that Israel uh, is not an apartheid state. So I want to play this one first. Things that you just described were simply not the case. Uh, Israel is not, well, Israel is not an occupying force in Gaza. Israelis can't even go into Gaza. Hamas, Hamas they cannot even go in. Now the soldiers are in there because of this war that you and I both disagree they, with. They're before October 7th. <clears throat> Excuse me? They were there before October 7th. No, Israel, Israelis cannot even go. I'm not, I'm not in any way arguing that the blockade of, of Gaza was not a good thing. However, Hamas, not all of the misery of the Gazans is due to Israel. Things that you just described. Okay, so that's that's the statement from Marianne about the occupation. Now, I would actually say that if you are if the people are under a blockade and they can't they can't move freely and Israel controls the resources, I would say they are occupied. And then I want you to hear what well, our allow, allow me just to do it one at a time because I'm okay. mentally exhausted and my memory is just not quite what it was, so I'm going to forget. First of all, I'm not politically correct. So I'm just going to speak my mind. Marianne Williamson is a, an airhead, and I don't see why anyone should take take into account anything she has to say about anything. Okay, she's good at self-help. Fine. If I needed self-help, I would go to Marianne Williamson. But I haven't a clue why she's commenting on these subjects. She has no idea what she's talking about. So let's start from the facts. It's the uniform, uniform opinion of every international organization and virtually every international lawyer, including the main Israeli lawyers, that Israel remains the occupying power in Gaza. Now, 
It controls everything that goes in, everything that goes out. It controls the airspace. It controls the water surrounding Gaza. It's as much an occupying power as if, to take a simple analogy, let us say there's a prison camp, okay? Or I should say just a prison. Let's say there's a prison. And one day it's decided that, you know what? We're sick of these uh, prisoners. So we throw them the keys and they open the cells. And now they're able to freely move inside the prison. But then the jailers exit the prison camp, excuse me, and exit the prison and shut tight the prison gates and then surround the prison. Would anybody in his or her right mind deny that Israel controls, excuse me, that the jailers control the prison? Right. They throw the keys to the cells, let them out of the cells, and then shut tight the prison and surrounded it. Is there anybody in his or her right mind, and here I exclude Marianne Williamson, is there anybody in his or her right mind who would deny that the jailers still control the prison? Now, Sabrina, let's say the prisoners, they elect, they elect a uh, uh, representatives, we'll call it the prisoner's council, okay? And the prisoner's council, yeah, they're a bit corrupt. I'm not going to deny that. And some of the troubles of the prisoners can be traced back to that prisoner's council. I'm not going to deny that. But in, is anyone in his or her right mind going to deny that overwhelmingly the problem is these jailers who have shut tight the prison gate and won't let in, if I can repeat myself, they won't let in nuts, biscuits, potato chips, musical instruments, toys, chicks, goats. I really wish Mary Ann Williamson, I'm sorry, I'm getting sick of this. I wish she would just shut up because she hasn't a clue what she's talking about. So she should just, just, I'm sorry for raising my voice. I'm not supposed to do that, but I'm tired. I just wish she would shut up because she hasn't a clue what she's talking about. And she speaks with such authority, like she's a graduate of a, a, a women's, fin a girl's finishing school. She speaks with such authority. Authority about what? Ms. Williamson, have you read a single book in the subject? Have you read a single human, ra human rights report in the subject? Have you read a single economics report in the subject? Then what are they talking about? Now, nobody has to be an expert on everything, obviously. And most of us are very narrowly focused in our areas of expertise. Most university professors, the only thing they know is the subject of their, you know, uh, doctoral dissertations. Uh, the number of bird droppings on day four of the French Revolution. That's all they know. That's their, you know. So <laughs> I'm not... I'm not saying you have to know everything, but really exercise a little bit of humility. As Chairman Mao famously said in his report from the peasant uprising in Hunan province, I think it was 1926, he famously said, no investigation, no right to speak, which in current lingo would be translated as, if you don't know what the F you're talking about, then shut the F up. And that's what I would like to say to Marianne Williamson. Just shut the F up because you just don't know what you're talking about. Stop embarrassing yourself. Stop embarrassing yourself. Now, I'm sorry if that was a little bit, uh, a little bit edgy, but I just really get tired of this. She talks as if she knows anything. You know, she might as well be talking about particle physics, which I'm sure, knowing her already, she probably does have some opinions on because she mastered the multiplication table in second grade. 
So the other, <laughs> so the other clip is RFK Jr. He was on uh, News Nation, and they were asking him um, about the apartheid. Uh, and so this is another one where I feel like he's another uh, candidate that is heavily, I feel, on purpose, uh, misrepresenting this issue with Israel and Gaza. And here's what RFK Jr. had to say. There's, there's just a tsunami of misinformation and kind of moral bankruptcy that we're seeing on the college campuses about this issue. And, and you know, the idea that uh, Israel is a is a apartheid state because it's a Jewish state. It, Israel is the only nation in the region that does not have an official religion. All the other surrounding nations are Muslim. You know, there's 40 nations in the world, 42 that have official religions. There is none in Israel. Israel is a free nation. It's a democracy. Palestinians in Israel can vote, they can hold political office, even the prime minister and the president of Israel, if they, if they, if they win that vote, they, they hold positions on the judiciary, every court, including the Supreme Court, they serve in the Knesset. A couple of years ago, a Palestinian judge, an Arab judge, convicted the prime minister of, of Israel for corruption. Um, Israel has freedom for for if in Gaza, it is you get the death penalty for selling land to a Jew. There are no Jews in in Gaza. Oh, you you know you look at this this double standard that is being now applied to Israel's behavior compared to the behavior of all the countries around it. Your thoughts? Those are just some of the things that RFK Jr. has said, but he's heavily come out uh, defending Israel. Some people are saying they feel like he's running to be prime minister of Israel, not president of the United States. But every opportunity that he gets, every interview he's gone on when this issue comes up, he purposely uh, smears the Palestinian people. What do you think about what he said about Israel not being an apartheid state? And would you be interested in actually having this discussion with someone like RFK Jr. or Marianne Williamson? I would not be interested in having the discussion with Marianne Williamson because it's like debating, a, uh, it's the equivalent of watching paint dry. There's, there's, uh, no, there's no mental stimulation that would, and no enlightenment that can come out of a conversation with Marianne Williamson on this particular topic, maybe on other topics, as I said, I'll defer to her on self-help. Um, on, the, on the question of uh, Robert Kennedy Jr., he describes what he calls this tsunami of misinformation on the college campuses. Well, Mr. Um, Mr. Kennedy, long before that tsunami of misinformation, the major human rights organizations weighed in on the subject. Amnesty International put out a 250-page report, very detailed, <clears throat> in which it said it pronounced that Israel is an apartheid state. Human Rights Watch put out a report. It stated that Israel practices in the occupied Palestinian territories, meaning the West Bank and Gaza, they constitute apartheid. Uh, those practices constitute apartheid. They said within the state of Israel itself, um, it's a uh, two-tier system, so, you know, sort of equivalent to our Jim Crow system after slavery. Uh, wasn't an apartheid system, but certainly wasn't a democratic system in any meaningful sense, be it the American South after slavery, after emancipation, or Israel today. Um, the Israeli main Israeli human rights organization is called B'Tselem. And it put out a report. I happen to agree with the B'Tselem report. It says, first of all, let's stop talking about occupied territories. There are no longer occupied territories. Israel has annexed them. Gaza, the West Bank, they're part of Israel because they've been part of Israel since 1967. 
Now, the essential feature which distinguishes a, a occupation from an annexation is very simple. Occupations are supposed to be temporary. If it's not temporary, then it becomes an illegal annexation. I think we can conclude um, 1967, uh, we're just a few, a few years shy of 67, yes, a few years shy of 60, 60 years after uh, 55 years or so, we can conclude the territories have been annexed. And so there's one state. There's one state from the Mediterranean to the Jordan, okay? And in that one state, about 5 million people have no right to vote. In fact, they have no rights at all. The people in the West Bank and the people in Gaza have no rights at all in the Israeli state, zero. So it's a very peculiar kind of democracy in which five of the 14 million people have no rights to vote, no rights, forget about no rights to vote, no rights, period. And the other 2 million, namely the Israeli Palestinians, they're second class citizens. There are 10,000 laws on the books in Israel which privilege the Jewish as against the non-Jewish population. So you can say of half of the 14 million people in the state of Israel, because the West Bank and Gaza are part of it, of the 14 million people, uh, overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, uh, seven of the seven million non-Jews Overwhelmingly, they have no rights, and a small fraction, 2 million of the 7 million, have um, second-class rights. And then I would just say, I don't have time to go through it right now, but there is such a long list now of Israelis, including Israelis in the, in the mainstream of uh, political life, uh, I can't even keep up anymore who have now conceded Israel has become an apartheid state. So yeah. what, what Robert Kennedy is doing here is uh, just repeating the talking points of his guru, uh, Shmuley Voliak or something like that. I call him Schmucky Voltax. I don't know what his name is. Uh, <laughs> you know, this ambulance chaser who calls himself a rabbi. Uh, I uh, I don't think there's any serious dispute. I, I would say, yeah, there's some argument about within Israel proper, how to describe it. When I say Israel proper, I mean the June 1967 borders. And there are differences of opinion uh, between Human Rights Watch, um, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, and Beth Selim. I'm inclined to the position of Beth Selim. Beth Selim's position is, uh, and when the Beth Selim position was announced, it was the head of Beth Selim, the executive director was a guy named Hagai el Ad, extremely decent guy. He was a Harvard PhD in physics, uh, who then devoted a significant period of his life. He since withdrew uh, or moved on I devoted about eight years, I think it was about eight years, I think, as being the executive director of Beth Selim. Uh, let me just repeat the name for your audience, Israeli uh, Center for Human Rights in the Occupied Territories. Um, and they issued the position paper. That's one state, he said, it said, it's a apartheid state. And the anchor of that apartheid state, it said, the foundation was, and I'm using him, his words, or the report's words, it was issued in the name of the whole Israeli information center, not just him, uh, based on the principle of Jewish supremacy. Now, when Robert Kennedy comes along and says it's the only non-religious state in the region, it's like, okay, how significant is that? So the United States wasn't effect effectively a Christian supremacist state. It was a white supremacist state, okay? It didn't use religious nomenclature. It used uh, racial nomenclature. Did that make it better? 
He knows full well that Israel describes itself as, quote, the nation state of the Jewish people. It's called the nation state law. It's a nation state of the Jewish people. Now it's true. They don't necessarily define Jewish as a religious denotation. It's also a racial one. If your mother is Jewish, you're Jewish, okay? Uh, even if you call yourself a Catholic, you're still Jewish because you inherit your mother's uh, racial identity, okay? So you can be an atheist, but for, uh, for the purposes at hand, you're still Jewish. So I'm an atheist, I'm not religious, but by Israel's standard, I count as Jewish, or at least at last count. I don't know what they'll do with me now, but currently I still have Jewish... I'm still Jewish. So, Mr. Kennedy, does that make that better? But it's not a religious privilege, it's a racial privilege. Does that make it better? You know, even the Nazis, the Nazis wanted to have racial distinctions, not religious ones, because they pride themselves on their racialist ideology. And so they really stumbled up again when it came to the Jews, because the only thing that distinguished one Jew from another, or from a non-Jew, was the religious aspect. Now, it may not be your religious aspect, but it could be your mother's religious aspect. Otherwise, there was no racial basis for determining that you were Jewish. So that was a real problem for the Nazis. And there's a whole, uh, you know, uh, scholarship and how the Nazis constantly adjusted this definition of uh, who is a Jew, because there was no uh, uh, racial basis for it. So then there was this whole complicated thing. If your grandmother was of Jewish religion, but your father was of non-Jew, grandfather was of non-Jewish religion, uh, and the child was what was called a mishlinga, M-I-S-C-H-L-I-N-G-E, meaning mixed race, a mishlinga. Should you be classified as German or Jewish? There's all these complications with the Nazis uh, who didn't want a religious categorization. They wanted a racial one, but couldn't figure out how to do it because there's no racial, uh, there's no, you know, there's no racial uh, uh, characteristic of Jews, no necessary no necessary racial characteristic of Jews. Obviously, you know, the same thing happened in the United States, and they end up with the one, you know, one drop rule. Uh, how do you prove somebody is black? Yeah. It's always it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Uh, I don't have time now, but it's a whole interesting question for me. At least I'm sure experts can tell me I have no clue what I'm talking about. But with all this talk about IQs and inherited intelligence. Uh, there is a whole question on what basis are you defining a person as black if you know in, in these IQ tests. So if you're using the one drop rule, then maybe the results are from the, the 99 out of 100 drops. It's not black. Do you get my point? So let's mm -hmm. say you get an IQ test which shows this person, uh, this African American, his IQ is below the average of the, the white IQ. But if you're using the standard of one drop, then maybe that IQ is really a white IQ, not really a black IQ. I don't know. I, I've always wondered about that. I've, I've never had a chance to ask experts uh, on this particular subject because it's been a matter of curiosity to me. Um, in any event, uh, so the, the, my my point is this thing about it's not the only non-religious. Yeah, fine, it's racial. That's better. You know, <laughs> so the Nazis didn't use whether you're Christian, that you're or Anglo-Saxon. They used whether they use a racial characterization. Even though, as I said, the racial characterization didn't even work. But leaving that aside, they use the race. Does that make it better? I mean, it's just so stupid what he's saying. Uh, he's not stupid, you know, in some things he's right. obviously knowledgeable. I'm not going to take that away from him. Uh, but in some subjects, he's just a complete opportunist. Uh, and, um, 
you know what they say he who pays the piper calls the tune and i'm sure shmooley's on working the phones raising money for uh robert kennedy and those folks have a lot of money and i may be accused now of anti-semitism but guess what i don't give a darn as um as Rhett Butler famously said to Scarlett O'Hara, uh, I don't give a damn. You know, that was the first yeah. curse word ever in the Hollywood movie. I don't give a damn. Um, the same people who are now uh, blackmailing the American, leading American universities by threatening to withhold $100 million here, $50 million there. I mean, that's significant money. Uh, they are the same ones who will give or not give to Robert Kennedy, depending on his stand on this hill. That's just a fact. I don't, I don't know why people would be shocked by that fact, uh, but we have a lot of money at stake. You know, these people are big rollers, as they say. Uh, you know, in the case of Harvard, the case of University of Pennsylvania, they were threatening in the, an individual, one person, a hundred million dollars. So when Shmuley rings them up, now most of them are going to give to Biden anyhow or Trump, but some of them will probably waver a little. And the litmus test is going to be the same as with the college presidents. Are you going to support Israel's genocide in Gaza? That's the litmus mm -hmm. test. So of course, he who pays the piper calls a tune and, um, there's a price to be had. He's a complete opportunist. And frankly, you know, when we're in the midst of a genocide, that's really quite revolting what he's saying. Norm Finkelstein, okay. thank you. Thank you I, so much for your time. You're welcome. And best of luck to you.